Grace and peace, my brothers and sisters, grace and peace. My name is Brother Yehuda, and I'd like to say grace and peace to my brothers in Born Again Israelites and Risen with Christ Ministry, my brother Karadazar and my brother Beloved. Grace and peace, my brothers, and grace and peace to all my brothers and sisters that support the gospel, that love the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, today's topic is Matthew called. We're going to be in the book of Matthew, chapter 9, verse 9 through 13. And I will read. And as Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom. And he said unto him, follow me. And he arose and followed him. And they came to pass as Jesus sat at meat in the house. Behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I read number 12 again. But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that be whole. But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, they that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. But go ye and learn what that meaneth, and I will have mercy and not sacrifice. For I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So what the Pharisees is thinking, they think, and the people do that in the churches. They look at a person, oh, why is he hanging out with that drunk man? Or why is he hanging out with that person? He be out in the street doing this and doing that. If you if you end the gospel, you're not coming to to the righteous because there are no righteous. Because if you're thinking like that, that takes you're not it's, it takes away you're, you're you're just as bad as you the one you consider to be the sinner. You're just as bad and even worse because you're being a hypocrite. And you're you're, you're not supposed to be. There's no judgment. Christ came for the sinners, not for the righteous, because that was like a figure of speech, because a metaphor, because. There is no righteous man. And I was just proving, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees mm -hmm. proved it all day long and throughout the scripture and the New Testament. So this is what Christ said, go and learn what that means. And I will have mercy because they are not understanding. Christ didn't come to, if you if, if he knew what it mean, he'll he'll humble himself and, be un, and come to Christ himself. As opposed to wondering why he's with the publicans and the sinners. He'll consider himself as a sinner. Now in these verses, we have an account of the grace and favor of Christ to poor publicans, particularly to Matthew. What Christ did to the bodies of people who, to the bodies of people was to make way for a kind design upon their souls. Now we're gonna observe here the call of Matthew, the writer of this gospel, Mark and Luke called him Levi. It was ordinary for the same person to have two names. Perhaps Matthew was the name he was most known by as a publican, and therefore, in his humility, he called himself by that name, rather than by the, the more honorable name of Levi. Some think Christ gave him that name of Matthew when the, when he called him to be an apostle as Simon, Christ's surname. I mean, yeah, Christ's surname Peter. Matthew signifies the gift of God. Ministers are God's gift to the church. Their ministry and their ability for it are God's gift to them. Now we're going to also observe here the posture that Christ called that, that Christ called found Matthew in. He was sitting at the receipt of custom, for he was a publican. Now we're going to go in the book of Luke, chapter five, verse twenty-seven, because they all witnessed the same thing. And after these things, he went forth and saw a publican named Levi sitting at the receipt of custom. And he said unto him, follow me. That's in the book of Luke, chapter 5, verse 27. And you see, as soon as Christ said, told Matthew to follow him, he got up and followed him. So you got to go with your calling. Don't go with your own mind, because your own mind will think that what you got to do is more important than what your calling is. So we have to understand that. Now, the, now that's in the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 27. Now the church is a company of sinners who are repentant through the grace of, of Christ. So now, if you're in the church, you consider yourself, you know that you're a sinner. That's why you're coming to the church, because you want to be happy, want, you want to repent 
for the remission of your sins. You're not coming to church because you're righteous. This is the part that people get confused with. You're coming to church humble and you're coming for repentance and forgiveness. This is the reason why you come to the church of Christ. Now the church is a company of sinners who are repentant through the grace of Christ, who banquet with Christ to the great offense of the proud and envious people of the world. Matthew was a custom house officer at the part of Capernaum, or an exerciseman or collector of the land tax. Now he was in his calling as the rest of them whom Christ called. We're going to go on the book of Matthew, chapter 4, verse 18. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon, called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. They were fishers. That's in the book of Matthew, chapter 4, verse 18. Now, Christ, knowing that he would eventually depart from us, even at the beginning of his preaching, gets himself... <clears throat> gets himself disciples of a heavenly sort, poor and unlearned, and therefore such as might be left as honest witnesses of the truth of those things which they heard and saw of the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> as Satan chooses to come with his temptation to those that are idle, so Christ chose to come with his calls to those that are employed. But it was a calling of ill fame among serious people because it was attended with so much corruption and temptation. And there were so few in that business that were honest, that was honest men. Matthew himself owns, owns what he was before his conversion, as does St. Paul. We're going to go on the book of 1 Timothy, chapter 1, verse 13. Who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious but I abstain mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief so Paul's explaining that he was a blasphemer he was a persecutor and he was an injurious but he did it out of ignorance because he was in unbelief he didn't he didn't understand the doctrine he was a child then so when he put away the childish things he became an adult and understood what the word is what the true doctrine is what the gospel is now that's in the book of First Timothy, chapter 1, verse 13. These are the praiseworthy works which Paul brags of, that the grace of Christ in calling him might be the more magnified, and to show that God has his remnant among all sorts of people. None can justify themselves in their unbelief by their calling in the world, for there is no sinful calling. But some have been saved out of it, and now, and, and no lawful calling, but some have been saved in it. The preventing power of this call, we find that we find not that Matthew looked after Christ or had any inclination or tendency to follow Christ, though some of his kindred were already disciples of Christ, but Christ prevented him with the blessings of Christ's goodness. He is found of those that seek Christ not Christ spoke first we have not chosen him but Christ has chosen us Christ says follow me and the same and the same divine almighty power accompanied this world to convert Matthew which attended that word we're gonna go on the book of Matthew chapters 9 verse 6 but that ye may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins then say he to the sick of the palsy, Arise, take up thy bed, and go unto thy house. That's in the book of Matthew, chapter 9, verse 6. Arise, and walk to cure the man sick of the palsy. And we're going to note that a saving change is wrought in the soul by Christ as the author, and his word as the means. Christ's gospel is the power of God unto salvation. We're going to get clarity, get confirmation on that in the book of Romans, chapter 1, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jews first and also to the Greek. That's in the book of Romans, chapter 1, verse 16. Now, this is the second part of the epistle until the beginning of the chapter 9. 
Now the whole end and purpose of the discussion is this. That is to say, to show that there is but one way to abstain unto salvation, which is displayed to us by God in the gospel. And that is equally to every nation. And this way is Jesus apprehended by faith. God mighty and effectual instruments to save men by. Now, this is God's mighty effectual instrument to save men by. Now, when this word Greek is contrasted with the word Jew, then it signifies Gentile. So when they say Greek, Jew and Greek, the Greek is, is referring to Gentile. The call was effectual for he came at the call he arose and followed Christ immediately, neither denied nor deferred his obedience. The power of divine grace soon answers and overcomes all objections. Neither has neither his commission for his place nor his gain by it could detain him. When Christ called him, he conferred not with flesh and blood. We're going to go on the book of Galatians chapter 1 verse 15 and 16. But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathens, immediately I conferred. I conferred not with flesh and blood. That's in the book of Galatians. That's Paul speaking once again. That's Galatians chapter 1 verse 15 and 16. Now, Paul speaks of God's everlasting predestination by which God appointed Paul to be an, an apostle, of which he makes three distinctions, the everlasting counsel of God, his appointing from his mother's womb, and his calling. And we see that there is no mention at all of foreseen works. Now, to Paul, and this is a type of speech which the Hebrews use, by which it shows us that this gift comes from God. He says this because it might be objected that he was indeed called by Christ in the way, but afterwards was instructed by the apostles and others, whose names, as I said before, the, the false apostles abused to, to destroy his apostleship, as though the delivered as though he delivered another gospel than they did and as though he were not of their number who are to be credited without exception therefore paul answered that he began immediately after his calling to preach the gospel at damascus and arabia it was not from that time in jerusalem except for 15 days when he saw only Peter and James and afterwards he began to teach in Syria and Sicilia, Sicilia with the consent and approval of the churches of the Jews who knew him only by name so far off was it that he was there instructed by men with any man in, with any man in the world he quitted his post and his hope of preferment in that way and though we find the disciples that were fishers occasionally fishing again afterwards we never find matthew at the receipt of customs again christ converts with publicans and sinners upon this occasion christ called matthew to introduce himself into an acquaintance with the people of that profession jesus sat at meat in the house we're going to go on the book of matthew chapter 9 verse 10 and it came to pass, as Jesus sat at meat in the house, be behold, many publicans and sinners, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. That's in the book of Matthew, chapter 9, verse 10. Now the publicans who were placed by the Romans after that time, Judea, was brought into the form of a providence to gather the taxes and therefore by the rest of the Jews, they were called sinners. That is to say, very vile men. Matthew made a great feast, which the poor fishermen, when they were called, were not able to do. But when he comes to speak of this himself, 
he neither tells us that it was his own house nor that it was a feast but only that he sat at meat in the house preserving the remembrance of Christ's favors to the publicans rather than of the respect he had paid to Christ it well becomes us to speak sparingly of our own good deeds now when Matthew invited Christ he invited Christ's disciples to come along with him they that welcome Christ must welcome all that are, that are Christ for Christ's sake and let, him, let them have a room in their hearts now he invited many publicans and sinners to meet Christ this was the chief thing Matthew aimed at in this tree that he might have an opportunity of bringing his old associates acquainted with Christ he knew by experience what the grace of Christ could do and would not despair concerning them they who are effectually brought to Christ themselves cannot but be desirous that others also may be brought to Christ and ambitious to of contributing something towards it true grace will not contentedly eat its morsel alone but will invite others when by the conversion of Matthew the profession was broken presently his house was filled with publicans and surely some of them will follow Christ as he followed Christ Andrew and Philip did we're gonna go to the book of John chapter 1 verse 41 he first findeth his own brother Simon and said unto him we have found the Messiah which is being interpreted the Christ that's in the book of John chapter 1 verse 41 that is Christ meaning the anointed one the king after the manner of the Jews the Jewish people we're going to go in the book of John, chapter 1, verse 45. Philip findeth Nathanael and said unto him, We have found him, and whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth and son of Joseph. That's in the book of John, chapter 1, verse 45. Now God uses the good and of the unlearned men, and God makes them teachers of the learned man. We're going to go in the book of John, chapter 4, verse 29. Come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? That's what that's what the Syrophoenician lady said when she went to the well. And Christ told her she had five husbands. That's in the book of John, chapter 4, verse 29. The displeasure of the Pharisees of at this. We're going to go in the book of Matthew, chapter 9, verse 11. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? You always have something to say. And this is what people do. You go to church. Why are they wearing that dress? Or why are they wearing that outfit? Why are they ain't combing their hair? Why are they coming this? Why are they coming late? Why are they this and that? As opposed to welcoming them into the grace, into the glory, and to, and and far as humbling themselves and being and be a merciful to the people that's arriving that's in the book of Matthew chapter 9 verse 11 how the public the, um, the, the Pharisees saw it when they said unto the, to his disciples why eateth your master with publicans and sinners their petty, their petty objections at it why eateth your master with publicans and sinners here we're going to observe that Christ was quarreled with it was not the least of Christ's suffering that Christ endured the contradiction of sinners against himself. None was more quarreled with by men than Christ that came to take up the great quarrel between God and man. That's why Christ came, to take up the hostility that we have between God and us, God and man. Christ denied himself the honor due to an incarnate deity which was to be justified in what Christ spent and to have all Christ said readily subscribed to for though Christ never spoke or did anything amiss everything Christ said and did was found fault with they always thought everything Christ did they said oh he did why he's doing that why is he doing that why is he healing on a Sabbath day they always had fault with Christ that's just going to show you how people are and Christ came to save them. Same people that's talking that, he came to save them. The same people that's in church, he came to save you as well. 
So you got to watch yourself when you come out and try to condemn somebody because you think you're so much in the right lane because you're a member of this so-called church. Humble yourself because if you don't, God said he will abase you. He, he will humble you. Now Christ taught us to ex expect and prepare for reproach and to bear it patiently. They that quarreled with Christ were the Pharisees, a proud generation of men, conceited of themselves and censorous of others, of the same temper with those in the prophet's time, who said, Stand by thyself, come not near me, I am holier than thou. They were very strict in avoiding sinners, but not in avoiding sin. <laughs> they're avoiding sinners as they would say sinner, but they're not avoiding sin because they're committing a sin when they think they're better than someone else. So you're not avoiding sin. None greater zealia than they for the form of godliness, nor greater enemies to the power of it. They were for keeping up the traditions of the elders to a nicety and so cultivate the same spirit that they were themselves governed by. They brought their cavil not to Christ himself. They had not the courage to face Christ with it, but to Christ's disciples. The disciples were in the same company, but the quarrel is with the master. For they would not have done it if Christ had not. And they thought it worse in Christ who was a master than in them. His dignity, they thought, should set him at a greater distance from such company than others. Being offended at the master, they quarreled with the disciples. It concerns true believers to be able to vindicate the just and justify Christ and Christ's doctrine and law, and to be ready always to give an answer to those that ask them a reason of the hope that is in them. We gonna get proof of that in the book of First Peter, chapter three, verse fifteen. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. That's in the book of First Peter, chapter 3, verse 15. So a person may say, well, you always got an answer for something. Well, if you're speaking of why am I walking in the fruit of the spirit and why am I walking with hope and I understand the doctrine, I have to have an answer for you. It's written. So I have to go by what's written, not the way men are gonna look at things. They're gonna look they gonna look at me the way they're gonna look at me anyway. So but I gotta stick firm and stand firm in the scripture. And this is what everybody has to do. Don't let no man deceive you and bring your heart out of the scripture, out of the gospel, out of following Christ, because they're telling you one thing and they, they look at you and trying to condemn you. Don't let them deceive you and have you lose faith. Keep your faith, stand firm in your faith, stand firm in your hope, and know that the word of God is true. This is where you got power over them. That's the armor that you put on. Now give God all prayers and glory and hang only on God and Christ. God will have us when we are afflicted for righteousness sake to be careful not for redeeming of our life either with denying or renouncing the truth. So it's not because your life is a state that you got to deny the truth and renounce it. That's not godly. God wants you to stay firm and to stand firm. And whether your life is at state, you know that this is the true word of God through the gospel of Christ. You stand firm with that. Let a person take your head off. John the Baptist was in the truth. You think he's, he's submitted to, to Herod because he was about to get his head cut off? No. It had to happen. I must decrease so he can increase. So I say he must decrease so Christ can increase. This is how we supposed to look at it. I must decrease. So a person say that you, you've given up your life for Christ, that doctrine got to be powerful. And he don't want us to be with violence or any such means, but rather to give an account of our faith boldly and yet with a meek spirit and full of godliness. So when we give our faith, we will still be humble, still be meek and loving and representing your faith in the gospel, in God, in Christ. Reference that the enemies may not have anything just 
justly to object, but may rather be ashamed of themselves. Because when you come at them with meek and humility, they may be ashamed of themselves. Like, wow, I messed with the wrong guy. While Christ is an advocate for us in heaven, let us be advocates for Christ on earth and may Christ reproach our own. The complaints was Christ eating with publicans and sinners to be intimate with wicked people is against the law of God. Now we're going to go in the book of Psalms, chapter 1, verse 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. So they, they're reading this and thinking that what David is writing here, they're thinking that he's talking about what Christ came to do. Christ came to, to, to the sinners so he can heal the sinners and free the sinners from sin. As opposed to the wicked ones thinking, why are you eating with that sinner? Call another person a sinner and you're just as bad as them. See, there's a difference in how you, your understanding is. And that's why they they read in that. they like, well, it's not godly for you to for you to um be eating with sinners. It's not godly for me to be eating with you because you consider that person a sinner and you consider yourself not a sinner. So now you're the one that's wicked. Understand the doctrine. Now that's in the book of Psalms, one and one. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. That's in the book of Psalms, chapter 1, verse 1. So now you're in a congregation with people, and they talking about somebody else, consider them or bringing up, trying to bring up their sins and not confronting the person with the problem that you have with them. And you agree, and you're going along with them. Yeah, I see them, isn't that? You're gossiping just as bad, just as well. Those are the wicked ones. The one that's humble and just want to get repentance and want forgiveness from the Father, coming sincerely and humbly and meek. Those are the ones that Christ receives. So understand it. If you're doing it, you got to repent from that because you're under grace. You can come out of it right now. Get get it done before Christ come back. Now, the argument in this book of Psalms is given to us by the Holy Spirit to be esteemed as a precious treasure in which all things are contained that bring to true happiness in this present life, as well as in the life to come. For the riches of true knowledge, for the for the riches of true knowledge and the heavenly wisdom are here set open for us to take of it most abundantly. If we would if we would know the great and high majesty of God, here we may see the brightness of it shine clearly. If we would seek his incompre incomprehensible wisdom, here is the school of the same profession. If we would comprehend his estimable bounty and approach near to it and fill our hands with that treasure, here we may have a most lively and comfortable taste of it. If we would know where our salvation lies and how to abstain to everlasting life, here is Christ our Redeemer and Mediator most evidently described. The rich man may learn the true use of his riches. The poor man may find full contentment. He who will rejoice will know true joy and know and how and how to keep measures in it. They who are afflicted and oppressed will see what their comfort exists in and how they should praise God when he sends them deliverance. The wicked and the persecutors of the children of God will see how the hands of God is always against them. And though he permits them to prosper for a while, yet he bridles them so much so that they cannot touch a hair of one's head unless he permits them. And how in the end their destruction is most miserable. Believe briefly here we have most re present remedies. Briefly here we have most present remedies against all temptations and troubles of mind and conscience. So that being well practiced in this we may be assured against all dangers in this life. Live in the true fear and love of God, and at length attain the incorruptible crown of glory, which is laid up for all who loves at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
When a man has once given place to evil counsel or to his own sin nature, he begins to forget himself in his sin and so fall into contempt of God, which is called the seat of the scorners. We're going to go in the book of Psalm, chapter 119, verse 115. Depart from me, ye evildoers, for I will keep the commandments of my God. That's in the book of Psalm, chapter 119, verse 115. And hinder me not to keep the law of the the law of the Lord. So it's what it's saying, depart from me, you evildoers, I will keep the commandments of my God. So you're not going to convince me or try to manipulate me to not keep the word of the Lord. Those are the evildoers. We want you to come and feed into their negativity. Those are the evildoers. It says, and hinder me not to keep the law. Don't try to keep me from keeping the law of the Lord. Now, perhaps by accusing Christ of this to his disciples, they hope to tempt them from Christ, to put them out of the conceit with Christ, and so to bring them over to themselves to be their disciples who kept better company for they can pass sea and land to make convert. So in other words, this is what the, the Pharisees are trying. They was hoping that they, they'll turn their mind, the, the disciples' mind off of Christ and bring them on to them. That's a bigger sin. They call it them sinners. They're, that's even worse. To be intimate with publicans was against the traditions of the elders. So that's the, that's the whole, that's the traditions of the elders. That has nothing to do with the doctrine of Christ. This is what we have to understand. These traditions that are under the elders that went in the Old Testament, what they still doing as of today is not of the gospel know what the gospel is and know understand the gospel is a humble doctrine and is about you coming to christ with repentance and, and sorrow for the forgiveness of your sins because the kingdom of heaven is at hand this is what the gospel is all about you repenting from what you're all doing being refreshing and renewed in your life being born again and become anew come out the womb of the sinful the sinful scorners and come and be and be birthed in a whole new life this is where it's at. Because while you're walking in sin, you're in the womb of the scorner, of the sinner, of the wicked. So you got to come out of that womb, that, that womb, and that's where the reborn again come. You're being reborn again. You came out that womb. Now you're you're coming to Christ. Now you're refreshing. Now you're reborn again. Now you become babies. Then you become children. You're infants. Then you become children. Babies. Then you become children. Then you become men. Men or women This is how you grow In the knowledge of Christ In the gospel Because you're not going to just jump in Because you read the scripture And say well I'm in the scripture I know this scripture I know that scripture I'm a child of God But you're not, your mind ain't fresh And your mind ain't clean You're still living worldly life Lifestyle And traditions That's not You got to come clean that Wipe that out of your mind Wipe that out of you Let, let the word cleanse you of that Now, therefore, they looked upon it as a heinous, heinous thing. To be intimate with publicans was against the traditions of the elders. And therefore, they looked upon it as a heinous thing. As opposed to looking at it for what it's worth. Christ came here to, to free the sin, sinners, to, to heal the sick. They were angry with Christ for this because they wished ill to Christ and sought occasion to misrepresent Christ now it is an easy and very common thing to put the worst construction upon the best words of a and actions because they wish no good to publicans and sinners but envy Christ's favor to them and were grieved to see them brought to repentance it may justly be suspected that they have not the grace of God themselves who grudge others a share in that grace who act not pleased with it. The, def the defense that Christ made for himself and his disciples is justification of their converse with publicans and sinners. The disciples, it should seem, being yet weak, had to seek for an answer to the, to the, to the Pharisees' cavil and therefore bring it to Christ, and he heard it. We're going to go in the book of Matthew, chapter 9, verse 12. But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, 
they that behold need not a physician, but they that are sick. That's in the book of Matthew, chapter 9, verse 12. Or perhaps overheard them whispering it to his disciples, let him alone to vindicate himself and to plead his own cause, to answer for himself and for us too. Two things he urges in his defense, the necessity and engines of the case of the publicans, which called aloud for his help and therefore justified him into conversion, conversing with them of their good. It was the extreme necessity of poor lost sinners that brought Christ from the pure region above to those impure ones. And the same was it that brought him into this company with which was thought impure. Now, he proves the necessity of the case of the publicans. They that behold need not a physician, but they that are sick. The publicans are sick and they need one to help them and heal them, which the Pharisees think they do not need help. That was a problem. Sin is the sickness of the soul. Sinners are spiritually sick. Ordinarily, corruptions are the disease of the soul. Actual transgressions are its are its wounds or the eruption of the disease it is deforming weakening and discrediting wasting killing but blessed be god not incurable jesus christ is the great physician of souls his curing of bodily diseases signifies that signifies this that he arose with healing under his wing he is a skillful faithful compassionate position and it is his office and business to heal the sick wise and good men should be as physicians to all about them christ was so a wise man cherishes towards all around him the feelings of a physician for his patients sin sick souls have need of this physician for their disease is dangerous nature will not help itself no man can help us such need have we of christ that we are undone eternally undone without him sensible sinners see their their needs and apply themselves to christ accordingly that's what you're supposed to do when you come to when you come to christ or the so-called churches you're supposed to be coming to christ never mind everybody else you supposed to be you're supposed to look at everybody in the same level we're all on this journey I'm here to be forgiven. I'm here to repent for my sins. This is what it is. That's when you come to Christ. You don't come to Christ to look at what everybody else is doing and what's going on here and boast about what you got and who you just bought this. I just got that. You know, this this person just got a new job. This person just lost their job. This person, he went bankrupt. That person just got divorced. Their, their marriage is breaking, all that other stuff. That's not the, what you're going to church for. Now we are undone, eternally undone without Christ. Sensible sinners see their need and apply themselves to Christ accordingly. There are multitudes who fancy themselves to be sound and whole, who think they have no need of Christ, but that they can shift for themselves well enough without Christ. As Ludicia in Revelations chapter 3 verse 17, because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods and have needs of nothing and knoweth not that thou art wretch and miserable and poor and blind and naked that's in the book of revelations chapter 3 verse 7 so you know you hear people say yeah i'm rich i don't need for nothing and i want my kids not to need for nothing how can you do that without christ how can you do that without the heavenly father how can you think that way you're supposed to stay humble and you get rich you're supposed to give to the poor whatever you have you got blessed you bless them that makes you rich not because you got a bank account full of money that's that's not the wrong riches it, it says in the scripture it's easier for a camel to get through an eye of a needle than a rich man to get through the kingdom i have trouble getting a thread through the needle to the eye of a needle so never mind a camel so now that was in the book of revelations chapter 3 verse 17 because thou say i am rich and increased with goods and have needs of nothing and knoweth that knoweth not that Thou art wretched 
and miserable and poor and blind and naked. So he's telling you, and you know not that you are wrenched and miserable and poor and blind. That's why you're speaking that way and trying to have people accept you for your riches. As opposed to being humble and understanding. You, you could be humble and, and not mention that and just give anonymously to the poor without being seen and without being on film or recording now you got riches because you understand the mercy you understand the glory and the grace the spiritual misery of men is metaphorically expressed in three points which are matched as corresponds as corresponds to those remedies offered in the book of revelation chapter 3 verse 18 I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich in white remnant, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thy eyes with eye slaves, that thou mayest see. Now the may see now the Pharisees des desire not to not the knowledge of Christ's word and and ways. Not because they had no need of Christ, but because they thought they had none. Okay, I'm sorry. Let me read this all over again. Revelations 3, verse 18. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich and white, and white, white remnant, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint thy eyes with eye slaves that thou mayest see. That's in the book of Revelation, chapter 3, verse 18. Now, what it's just saying here is, I counsel thee to buy of me gold, tried in the fire. So your goat had to be tried in the fire, had to be purified. That's what we have to be tried in the fire and be purified through the word of God. That thou mayest be rich in knowledge of God. And the white remnant be made up pure and sanctified, purified with the white remnant, that thou mayest be clothed with the fruit of the spirit, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. We don't worry about the nakedness. Being naked in the knowledge, being naked in Christ, being naked in the wisdom of God, being naked of your salvation and your inheritance, being naked. Now you don't. It, it's. It doesn't do not appear and anoint thy eyes with eye slave. So this way you're not looking at the lust and at the, the luxurious things of the world and the traditions of what's going on here. The distractions that thou may have seen. Now you see the light. You see Christ. You see the heavenly father. You see the heavens. You see the glory of the grace. You see the good in the knowledge of Christ, in the, in the doctrine of the gospel. Now that's in the book of Revelations, chapter 3, verse 18, because people get confused with that. They think that they talk about worldly gold and worldly clothes. And it's not talking about going to the Gucci store, going to the, that type of clothing, or get a white linen suit from Versace. It's not talking about that. It's talking about the, the garment that Christ's going to put on you. The heavenly garment. The fruit of the spirit garment. Now the Pharisees desire not the knowledge of Christ. Christ's word and way, not because they had no need of Christ, but because they thought they had none. Now we're going to go on the book of John, chapter 9, verse 40 and 41. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him, Are we blind also? Jesus, and then Jesus answered, Jesus said unto them, If ye were blind, ye should have no sin. But now ye say, We see, therefore your sins remain. So <laughs> that knowledge is brilliancy, but you have to understand what Christ is saying. Christ said unto them, if you were blind, you would have no sin. So now if you're blind, say, listen, I'm blind. And now you're humbling yourself and you're, com you're admitting to the fact that you are doing wrong. Please give me the vision so I can see the glory and the light that you shine upon me. Now, you're, he said, you, if he said, Jesus said unto them. If you were blind, you should have no sins. Because you're blind, you're humbling yourself. But now you say, we see, therefore, yes, your sins remain. The so person said, yeah, I, I'm woke. I am see, I see this and this and that. I know this, I know that. You can't tell them nothing. They think they got all the vision. They had their sins remain because they're too arrogant. 
you got to understand. I don't care how long you think you are in this world, how wise you may think you are, and how well you look at a person to be this wise man or this motivational speaker. They have to humble themselves along with yourself. You have to humble yourself this long with me. I have to humble myself. I have to come and still be taught. As long as I'm here in the grace of God, I have to be willing to be taught and learn. So I have to continuously study in the scripture and study and be willing to be taught by Christ. I don't get beside myself because I, I, I study a few scriptures and now I'm, oh, I don't need the book no more. I can put it away. Just ask me questions. I can answer everything. No, I still need to study. I still have to seek knowledge of God. Not my own knowledge, the knowledge of Christ, the knowledge of God through the gospel because Christ is the word of God. So now I don't want my sins to, to be remaining because I say I see. No, I'm still learning. This doctrine is a lifetime doctrine that we have to study on. Until Christ come back, we have to study three square meals to eat that scripture to be knowledgeable of Christ. And we have to keep it in us every day. We can't go once a week and think that, oh, okay, I'm fine. All right, I'll go back next Sunday. No, that's not the way it works. You have to get that knowledge every day. That's why I send scripture every day, because it has to be taught every day. We have to, we have to digest that every day so in order for our mind to be fresh, because we got so much corruption and distractions in our heads with TV shows, movies, plays, sports, events, series, all this stuff that's distracting us from our inheritance, from Christ, keeping us, blocking us from Christ. The world will keep you all blocked up. Now, Christ proves that their necessity did sufficiently justify Christ's conduct and conversing, com conversing familiarity with them and that Christ should not to be blamed for it for that necessity made in an act of charity which ought also be preferred before the for, for, formal out formality of the gospel profession in which the, the act of charity and great generosity are far better than magnificence as much as substance and much better than show or shadow. So the act of charity and a great generosity are far much better than magnificence, as much as substance is much better than show or shadow. Those duties which are of moral and natural obligations are to take place even of those divine laws, which are which are positive and ritual, much more of those impositions in, in of men and traditions of the elders which make God's laws stricter than God has made it. This Christ proves in the book of Matthew, chapter 9, verse 13. But go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy on and not sacrifice, for I am not come to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. So Christ is telling the Pharisees, because you know they always got something to say. And he said, the one that's the one if the one is not sick don't need a physician. I come to the sick. They need a physician. And he told them to go learn what that means. Because you know, you're questioning what I'm doing here. Go learn what I'm talking about first. That's who you got to that's who you gotta to submit to. You got to submit to the word of God, the gospel. You gotta to submit to Christ. He has all power. All judgment is handed into his hands. So you got to go learn what that means. Go learn what that means, and he will and I will, he said, I will have mercy and not suffer, for I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So, he's not going to speak the way you want him to speak. You got to go learn what that means if you really want to follow the word of God. That's in the book of Matthew, chapter 9, verse 13. By a passage quoted out of Hosea, chapter 6, verse 6. For I desire mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. So this is what people thinking that the traditional days that they follow in is, is much more glorious than the knowledge of God. That's why people fall short. They get off course because they're taking traditions and putting it in the way of the knowledge of God. And it has no knowledge in God. That's, that, that's not the knowledge of God when you're going through the tradition of man. The tradition of the elders, these holy days and holidays, all these rituals is not the work of God. It's not the will of God. 
So that's what the, we get confused with. So that's why Hosea said in chapter 6, verse 6, For I desire mercy and not sacrifice and the knowledge of God more than a burnt offering. So when they was doing burnt offering, he said, I'd rather have the knowledge of God and I'd rather have mercy than have than, than, than a burnt offering. God is pleased with that. Because that's what he wants. He wants you to seek his knowledge first. Never mind all the other stuff. Now, he shows to what God's doctrine was aimed at. That they should unite the obedience of God and the love of their neighbors with outward sacrifices. I will have mercy and not sacrifice that ill-tempered separation from the society of publicans, which the Pharisees enjoined was less than sacrifice, but Christ conversing, conversing with them was more than an act of common mercy, and therefore to be preferred by before it, if to do well ourselves is better than sacrifice, as Samuel shows in the book of First Samuel, chapter fifteen, verse twenty-two and twenty-three. And Samuel said, "Has the Lord as as great delight in burnt offering and sacrifice as in obeying the voice of the Lord?" Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity of idolatry, because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord. He has also rejected thee from being king. That's in the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 15, verse 22 and 23. So Samuel is speaking. He's telling you that all that idol worshiping idols witchcraft all that stuff that you that you think you're doing and as that you think you're doing the will of god or doing it in jesus name whatever the case you may be doing is in that stubbornness that's idolatry because it rejects the word of the lord that's as simple as it can be that's why we need to stay in the scriptures and understand what the doctrine is stick with this that's it just the the, the bible the Holy Bible is your answer. It's your key to success. It's your key to freedom. It's your key to peace. It's your key to love. It's your key to communication with the Heavenly Father in Christ. This is where it's at. It has no other way. Because everything is written in the book. Don't let man talk to tell you what they feel about it. You've got to go feel it yourself. Because this is how it works. You have to be called into it yourself. Now, much more to do good to others, Christ conversing. With sinners is here called mercy to promote the conversion of souls is the greatest act of mercy imaginable. It is saving a soul from death. We're gonna go on the book of James, chapter five, verse twenty. Let him know that he which converted the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sin. That's in the book of James, chapter five, verse twenty. Now we're gonna observe how Christ quotes this. Go ye and learn what that meaneth. It is not enough to be acquaint, acquainted with the letter of Scripture, but we must learn to understand the meaning of the Scripture. And they have best learned the meaning of the Scripture that have learned how to apply them as a reproof of their own faults. So you have to recognize your, when you read the Scripture to learn it, you got to understand and take it and say, well, wow, this is what I'm doing wrong. You got to Understand your own faults first before you try to tell tell somebody else they're a sin, sinner. And a rule of their own practices. This is what you got to come out of that. This scripture which Christ quote, quoted served not only to vindicate him but to show wherein the true gospel consists. Not to eternal observ observance, observances, not in meats and drink and shows of It shows of, sanct of sanctuary, of being sanctified, not in little particular opinions and doubtful dis dis disputations, but in doing all the good we can to the bodies and souls of others, in righteousness and peace, in visiting the fatherless and the widows, to con condemn the hypocrisy of those who place the gospel in rituals more than in morals. We're going to go in the book of Matthew, chapter 23, verse 23. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye pay tithes and mint and anise and cumin 
and have omitted the weight the weighter matter of the law judgment mercy and faith these ought ye to have done and not to leave the other undone that's in the book of matthew chapter 23 verse 23 they espouse those forms of godliness which may be made consistent with and perhaps subservient to their pride covetousness ambition and malice while they hate that power of it which is mortifying to those lusts now christ urges the nature and end of his own commission he must keep to his order and persecute that of which christ was appointed to be the great teacher now says christ i am not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance and therefore must converse with publicans what christ's errand was to it was to call to repentance this was christ's first text when he first got on the mount we're gonna go back in the book of matthew chapter 4 verse 17 for the time jesus began to preach he and said and say repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand this is the first duty of man that's in the book of matthew chapter 4 verse 17 and it was the tendency of all christ's sermon the gospel call is a call of to repentance a call to us to change our mind and to change our ways with whom christ Aaron lay not with the righteous but with sinners that is if the children of men had not been sinners there have been no occasion for christ coming among us christ is the savior not of man as man but of men as fallen men had the first Adam continued in his original righteousness, we had not needed a second Adam. Therefore, his greatest business lies with the greatest sinners. The more dangerous the sick man's case is, the more occasion there is for the physician help. Christ came into the world to save sinners, but especially the chief. We're going to go on the book of First Timothy chapter 1 verse 15 and hear Paul. And I speak for myself. This is a faithful saying, the worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, for whom I am chief. That's in the book of First Timothy, chapter one, verse fifteen. To to call not those so much who thought sinners are comparatively righteous, but the worst of sinners. The more sensible any sinners are of their sinful sinfulness the more welcome will christ and his gospel be to them and every one chooses to go where christ's company is desired not to those who would rather have their own room or office christ came not with an expectation of succeeding among the righteous those who conceit themselves so and therefore will sooner be sick of their savior than sick of their sins so they'll be more sicker than christ than of their sin itself and what they're doing wrong but among the convinced humble sinners to them christ will come so be humble my people for to them christ will be welcome in christ jesus name may god be the glory as i walk live and pray in your image and likeness the fruit of the spirit i come in love and leave in peace Grace and peace and much love and blessings to you and your family. Have a blessed day to all the saints, my brothers and sisters, in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen.